think, what would be a qualitative observation of this picture? What do you got? Okay. So a qualitative observation would be that there's two sheep. You're just going to keep that silent, or do you want to vocalize that disagreement? Okay, so there's an argument now that quantitative is two sheep. Okay. So one of the things that we could try to take advantage of is use the stem word. We could use the English language to help us kind of piece our way through this. At the front of quantitative, we have quantit, kind of like quantity. Okay. At the front of qualitative, we've got quality. Okay. So a quantity would be like a number. So two sheep is an awesome observation, but that would represent more the quantity of them, not the quality. What else do you have? What other observations are out there? Okay. We could go through and call them fuzzy. Right, and I'm sorry, I gotta fix the color coding there. It started to bother me. We go through and say there's two sheep. Two sheeps. <laughs> what else do we have? The Resolution of the photo. Wow, okay. I can accept that. That definitely works. Okay. That's now looking at the image itself, not what's in the image. Both of those are valid interpretations of this because it doesn't, or I didn't specify. So that works. The resolution, depending on how we would reference the resolution, could probably go either direction, right? You could quantify the number of pixels, or you could say the resolution was low or high. So it could probably go in either case. So I'm going to write that down there, too, while Nadia shouts out another thing. OK. You could start referencing location. Location's too many letters. Anything else? Are there other quantitative observations than just two sheep? Okay, we could count the number of trees. I didn't want to count them. We could break down the brown branches. We could say the number of hooves. So we're getting a lot of counting. That's useful. Those are quantitative. Are there other quantitative things that we could potentially observe about these? How many what? Eyes. Eyes. That's again a counting of these. Oh, it's the picture, okay. The picture has four sides. We could reference the four sides again, counting. Anybody work on a farm or live near a farm? No? Yeah? yeah. Okay. When you see a sheep, what, what else might you reference other than the quantity of them? <laughs> Based off of the size of that sheep, you could be quantifying how much you have to clean up for them. That works. Why would you have a sheep? The wool. You could look at that and say that there are, I don't know, five pounds of wool. I do not live on a farm, and I know nothing about this. So I'm just making numbers up in units. Okay. We could say we got 50 pounds mutton, right? Get that right? I'm going to stick with meat. Okay. So depending on what we want to go through, we could be drawing different aspects out of this. Okay. Which of those observations is the most important? OK, 
right? All of those are important. I'm a butcher. Do I care about the fuzzy sheep? Depends on the context that I'm now observing that on. If I'm a butcher, I could care less about the fuzziness of the sheep because more than likely what's going to come to me? The meat without the fuzziness of the sheep. Okay? So I'm going to care more about the meat that's inside that. Okay? If I'm a t-shirt maker, do I care about the 50 pounds of meat? No. What do I care about? I care about how much wool I've got. Is that the only thing I would care about? How small it is, how clean it is. How clean is the wool? Okay. Is that sheep just crawling through trees and getting crap all junked up in it that I now have to clean out? Okay. So depending on the context of where we're looking at these observations, we can make different conclusions about what we're trying to get to. So a lot of this comes from the context, or we could even spin it a little bit more, and the audience of who's actually observing this. So the audience plays a role not only in what we write and present for other people, but also when we're observing science. Okay? So when we look at our observations, typically we stick with qualitative observations at first. Why do we tend to stick with qualitative observations? It's a good thing I deleted all those pictures, all the writing. Why do the qualitative observations tend to be, I was going to say woof. What was I writing with W? It must have been wool. We'll go with fuzzy. We had fuzzy. We have 50 pounds. Why might qualitative observations be some of the first things I would make? What do you got? Because uh, that's usually what makes things better. Does the butcher care about the fuzziness? Could do the quality of the meat. So once we got down to the meat, okay, we could care about the quality by observing that meat. At this point, we aren't there. All we've got is the 50 pounds. I can look at a sheep and go, oh, that sheep's got 50 pounds of meat on it after I cut it up. Anybody know? Is that, is is that reasonable? Is more like face value? Like, wait, just okay, it's just what you see. Yeah. Okay. That might be a relatively easy thing to observe because it's immediately what I see. Why are the quantitative harder to see? Think about it okay, you might have to process it out. Okay. How do you know it weighs roughly 50 pounds? You can just feel something and tell me the weight of it? <laughs> That's impressive. Okay. Doing a weight, we would have to use an instrument. An instrument would have to report that value to us. So we would have to have an instrument to allow us to make that correct assumption. When we're just using our eyes and saying it's about 50 pounds of meat, we're using our understanding of previous instrument measurements to actually approximate that. Does anybody know how much a sheep weighs? We have a couple people that lived on farm, near farm. Eight pounds. Eight pounds. Eight pounds. Eight pounds. <laughs> of course, you and the sheep stuff would give me that <laughs> response. 200 pounds? So 50 pounds is a little Average bit short. Average sheep weight, short. male 99 to 350, female yeah, 99 to 220, according to Google. Well, you cut out all the bones, 50 pounds like of meat, right? Oh, different breeds. <laughs> okay, let's not go there. Right? But the quantitative, it needs an extra step. The qualitative tends to be our initial observations. So if we think back to origins of science, in the origins of science, what are we going to make as our primary observation? Probably going to do a lot of qualitative observations. Once we start to accumulate those qualitative observations, we may want more detail behind it so that we can compare things across different systems. That's where we can start to bring in the quantitative. Okay? This is one of the things that becomes a bit unfortunate, particularly in lab. If you're in lab, what do you tend to write down? How much did it weigh? Most people will ignore the qualitative observations. Okay? That's 
qualitative observations are a really good thing to observe. If I gave you a glass and I said, this is water, please drink it, and you look in the glass and it's black, <laughs> you, you probably don't believe me. Okay? But if it's a clear liquid, now you might believe me. Okay? That qualitative observation caused you to very quickly change an opinion without having to do any kind of quantitative stuff. If we take careful observations, our observations have to cover both. If they don't have both those observations, we start to lose that value behind what we're observing. Okay? So let's start with our qualitative. 70 to 80% composition of life. What is it? Water. Water. Okay. Water is a pretty neat substance to start our qualitative observations on. Any ideas why? Because it's 70 to 80 percent composition of water. It's everywhere. So that's a good place to start. Why else might water be an interesting place to start? We can get three different forms of water relatively quickly and easily. Most other substances we can't do that as easily for. What are those three different forms? Solids, liquids, and gases. I don't know why I'm writing that, because you already knew that, and I'm about to just delete all that text. But hey, okay, we've got those observations. We can now start to make observations about those and compare those qualitative observations across. That can help us categorize what makes a solid. So for instance, a solid, okay, might not run away from me if I poured it on a counter. If I put a solid on the counter, what's going to happen to it? It's going to stay there. Okay? Depending on the substance, it might melt and convert into a liquid. Okay? But I can now start to categorize properties of those materials by looking at shape, volume, compressibility. Some of those I could get into and quantify, but I don't have to necessarily. So if we consider the shape of a solid, okay, what's going to happen with the shape of a solid? Okay. The pen here is what? Solid. What happens to its shape? It stays the same. Okay. That shape is static, unchanging. Uh, and you just drank all that. This sort of works. I'm going to steal your drink. That becomes a little bit trickier. What phase? Liquid. What happens to the shape? It forms to the container it holds to. So that shape is highly variable. If I dropped the pen inside this, I'm not going to. OK? Probably better for me than for you. Uh, the pen doesn't change its shape. Okay. What about a gas? What happens to the shape of a gas? It fills the entire space. So it's kind of like a liquid. It changes all the time, right? So liquids and gases have the sh same shape. No. What do you mean, no? In that container that was holding the liquid, if it was a gas, where's that substance going to be? It's going to be evenly dispersed through the entire container. So when we talk about the liquid shape, okay, it does change depending on the container that holds it, but its volume stays constant. Whereas the gas, what happens? It changes based on the shape of the container, but it's also dependent heavily on the volume of the container because the gas will fill the entire container evenly. Okay? Compressibility. Thank you. What is compressibility? How much can you change the volume? Okay, well, with the solid, our shape and volume were static or constant. Am I going to be able to compress the solid? Significantly. Take the table in front of you. You got a little pinch fingers and pinch the table for me. Did that compress much? Okay. 
Most solids do not compress much. We get very small changes in the compressibility. Okay? Why is that? Well, if I drew out a picture of, say, water, let's be a really simple picture of water. You guys ready? Ta-da! There's my picture. That is water, a single molecule of water, a single piece. If I look at a solid, what happens? I now need lots of water. It's now locked into that shape. Okay? The volume can't change because to be a solid, these, those all have to be connected. To compress this, there has to be some place for those solids to go. They're all touching each other. Where can they compress to? Okay. You might say, well, you could just shift it a little bit. Yeah, I can shift it just a little bit so the bottom of that circle falls into that little space. Is that much of a compression? No. What happens when I move to a liquid? Can I compress liquids? Well, what happened with their volume? They move, their shape moved, but what happened to their volume? It stays the same. Why does it stay the same? They're already stacking pretty efficiently. There's a little bit more space there, okay, but not a lot. Right? So I can compress liquids a little bit more than solids, but that's like saying I'm a little bit, well, I don't. One cheese is a little bit softer than another cheese. Uh, I, sorry, bad at examples off the top of my head. Okay? There's not a big difference there. Okay. Cheddar versus Parmesan, right? You're like, what the heck are those cheeses? Okay. But if I now switch it up to, say, brie, is that difference now significant? Yeah. So when I jump up to the gas, what happens with my depiction now? Now I can compress. That means the space between those individual water molecules must be a lot bigger which means I can now push down on those molecules and they can move large distances. Okay. So I can start to classify different phases of matter based off of these simple qualitative observations. These simple qualitative observations go all the way down to now an insanely tiny level. We're making predictions about what these things look like without actually being able to see an individual piece. That's pretty cool. Okay? But that gets us our primary categories for matter. If we now push out a little bit more in depth with matter, we can now look at how we could separate those out. We end up with mixtures and pure substances. Okay? Well, what's the difference between a mixture and a pure substance? What is a mixture? Okay. How many people, this is your first chemistry class? Okay, I heard reference to compound and molecule, both of which are chemistry terms. And if this is your first chemistry class, I might as well have called them gobbledygooks. That doesn't help. Okay? This is a problem with how we teach chemistry. You kind of have to accept things as we present them and hope that when you learn a little bit more language, you can come back and make sense of it. Okay? So our mixture is more than one thing. Okay? What makes it different than a pure substance? A pure substance could also be more than one thing. Okay? So let's take a look at two things, A and B. How do you know they're different? Because what? They appear, they appear different. We can look at the text to reference that difference. We're using language to help us differentiate and show those differences. We could have also used squares and circles. Red A's, blue A's. We can use colors. Anything that we can do to encode that difference. Okay. Well, we said a pure substance and a mixture could be more than one thing. So a mixture is AB and a pure substance is AB. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, I just drew the exact same thing for two different objects. It's not a really good example then, is it? Okay. Well, this gets into that reference of compound. What makes a compound? Okay. Well, a compound or a molecule is something that is chemically linked. This was your first chemistry class. Compound and molecule are foreign terms. This is your first chemistry class. To define compound and molecule, what did I just use? Chemical. Yet another chemistry term that you don't have the wherewithal to actually draw connections to. Okay. That chemical linkage we tend to represent with a line. Okay. Or we could change our representation to be this. What's the difference now between those two representations? How do you know the pure substance, AB, is together as opposed to the mixture, AB, not being together? There's a different spacing. Okay, you're telling me that that right there is not a space. It's a different space. Meaning can change with just the length of empty space? Yeah, a lot. Okay? A lot of meaning can change there. And what we're starting to look at is the visual design of how we present that content so that people in our field would understand it. Okay? Another example that we can go through here, Justin, right? Okay. If we are now together. Together, together, you know? Roughly the same space. Are we a mixture or are we a pure substance? Okay. How about if I'm standing with my wife now? That's clearly a different relationship, right? Okay, I would hope to. <laughs> That would be really surprising, right? Okay. Is that relationship with my wife now a mixture or a pure substance? It's still a mixture. That's spinning on what is chemically linked versus spatially linked. Spatially just means they're near, okay? Right? Could I say my arm is near my torso? Yes. Is it spatially linked? If my arm just kind of went, you would just be like, yeah, that was normal. <laughs> just like when I walked away from Justin, you didn't like freak out, right? Okay. If my arm just floated off away from my body, are you going to have a little bit of a problem? Yes. Yeah. Why? Is my arm connected to my torso a mixture? No. no. It's chemically linked. It is physically, or not, I can't use the word physically. It is chemically linked to my body. Okay? The same thing is happening with our compounds. How we represent that with our compounds requires more chemistry that we haven't talked about yet, so we'll have to wait till we get there. Okay? But that at least gets us some kind of a baseline to allow us to differentiate those two. Does that make sense? So, yes. like, so, like water, like water. so if we looked at water, okay, so let's get really particular now about water. Anybody know the formula for water? Uh, depends. So there's a representation of water. Okay. Is that a mixture? No. Is that a mixture? No. Oh, I see. But they're not connected. All together, a mixture. Those two compounds are now spatially linked to each other, or those two molecules, if we will, are spatially mixed. Okay. So a glass of water would be a mixture. Of so now let's move to the next part. The pure substance says we're chemically linked. Is the red water different from the red water? Uh, they're in different spaces. They're in different. Yeah. Exactly right. Okay. They are different molecules that are now spatially linked. But since they are the exact same substance, individually, 
it is a pure substance. We're just looking at the amount of them. Like clones of me. Okay. That would not be interesting. See you fence yourself. No. Wayne, you were you. Okay. So it's very easy to muddy the water within this, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. As we continue through, we'll actually start to reference what makes a chemical linkage. Once we have that, we can now reference back to this a little bit cleaner. So yes. Salt to water would be a pure substance. So now what happens if we add salt to water? What is salt? Sodium chloride. Those two are now spatially linked, just like we had for the water. Can they be a pure substance? Is H2O the same thing as NaCl? No. How do you know that? They're different letters. Okay. We have represented them by letters. Those are different letters. Those are not the same substance, which means we're now having spatially linked different things. Okay. We have different things of changing amounts. The mixture and the pure substance don't really reference amounts. It's just what is there. Okay. If I have two different things that aren't chemically linked, that's now a mixture. Okay. What makes it chemically linked is that one atom is sharing electrons with another atom. I just used a whole bunch more terms that we haven't discussed as well. Okay, and that becomes the problem with this, is that we're trying to make definitions around something that we don't have a fundamental basis to explain. Hopefully by the end of unit one, this will help clarify because we'll know what chemically linked means. And this is true, this is a really common challenge as you go into any new discipline. A lot of times students will, or anyone, will struggle when learning something new because they don't understand the base language that is common to that context. And so as you go through, with Chem 130, this is an intro level class, so Mike's taking time to build that language for you. Um, but if you go into a more advanced class, and they're, they're just going to start throwing terms at you without giving the context, without making those connections. This is a really important thing so that you know why it is that you might be having a challenge with some class content. It's, the, it's a new language. It's a new discourse. And until you have that language, you're kind of just floating through it. Okay? Because then we've now established that you don't know what's above. Let's continue. What if I have a heterogeneous mixture versus a homogeneous mixture? All right. Well, what would a heterogeneous mixture be? Cereal and milk. Okay. Cereal and milk works. Okay. What did you suggest? Soup with stuff in it, like carrots or whatever. A soup, like a vegetable medley soup. We've got the broth and the carrots that are in it. There's a, we can see that there's a physical separation between those pieces. Okay. Now we have a visible separation. Okay, what would homogeneous mean? Salt water. Coffee could get a little bit challenging, unfortunately, um, depending on how you like your coffee. Uh, salt water works. Because when I take water, a liquid, and solid, salt, a solid, and I put them together, what happens? I end up with one new thing. I do not physically see the difference between the liquid water and the solid salt. It's now become one system. That is now a, a homogeneous system because there's no visible separation. I can't see the difference. Does that make sense? That does rely that we can see. That's what's allowing this. And you might, oh, can't everybody see? We'll address that in just a second. What do you got? Uh, I was just going to ask if salt water is a good example for a uh, homogeneous um, mixture. We can just assume, like, so we can assume then that water and salt don't chemically link for, this, for the sake of this exercise, right? Or is there... Is I'll there say for the sake of the exercise, yes. We kind of addressed that up here. Water and salt is not a pure substance. It was a mixture. Okay, so what you're saying is, well, if we say salt and water is homogeneous, it then must be a mixture and they aren't chemically linked. 
The only reason we can get to homogeneous oh. is because we know it's a mixture. Right. So Never you end up me. going in a cyclic self-definition loop. Right. Okay. Heterogeneous bowl of cereal. Cereal's next letter is an E. Thank you. Fudge. Okay. So here's another one. Okay. Air. What is air? Homogeneous or heterogeneous? Okay. Well, let's think. It is a mixture. It's a mixture of what? How do we know it's a mixture? For us to live, what must be in air? Oxygen. What do we exhale? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. So right out of the gate, there's two things. Okay? If they were chemically linked, we wouldn't have oxygen, we wouldn't have carbon dioxide. They'd be chemically linked. Okay? So we know right away that they're a mixture. So now the question is, is it heterogeneous or homogeneous? Can you see the difference between the carbon dioxide and oxygen? No. No. Okay. So there is no visible separation. Air is a homogeneous mixture. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Oh, we got a question first. Yeah, I got a question. I'm sure you're going to get to it. But Maybe. Where, where is the line drawn between visible separation? Because air can have dust in it, ran in C, and it's still considered air unless you specify pure air. So visible becomes very, very challenging to deal with. Right, you can still okay. see the difference. Some. If you got down to it, you, had to you could make it visible. No, unfortunately, you wouldn't. You would be able to tell that it was salt water, but you're not visibly seeing that difference. Right. As uh, I, I, I don't think you're going that direction. But yes, I can see where you can come up with that. You're way beyond what you need to. Because that's going to be the next part that we're going to address. Let's pick something that's a little bit less zeroed in. Fog. I know we live in Arizona. But we've seen fog at some point, right? Heterogeneous or homogeneous? You can't visibly see water droplets. But you do see the end result of there being water droplets there. What is the end result? Loss of visibility. Light passes through air. Why does light not pass through fog? What is it encountering? Liquid water. That liquid water just happens to be such a fine particle size that it's not raining. It's just sitting there. Okay. If the temperature changes enough either direction, you can get it condensing completely out as rain, or it evaporates away. But there is another phase there that's causing the disruption of light. So depending on what instrument we're using, visibility is in pretty big air quotes. And that's where it becomes challenging to deal with. Okay. And I would argue with water, the visibility is we're still using the human eye. To get into the difference for seeing the difference between salt water and normal water, you're using an instrument to pick up that difference. So is it okay. hetero or homo? Fog, hetero. Okay. And the fun thing about it is that this is largely a gradation. At one end, it's obviously heterogeneous, cereal and milk. At the other end, it's obviously one thing, or homogeneous, salt water. Are there things in between that are confusing as all hell? Yeah. Okay. Where do you get tested? You'll get tested at the extremes. Okay. You won't be tested through the middle. And even with that, it becomes a challenging question to ask on an exam. Okay. Is it a reasonable expectation that everybody has had cereal and milk before? <laughs> Maybe. What if you're from a different country? <laughs> Just because it exists doesn't mean someone's experienced it. Not every 
Okay. Are there tribes that are not exposed to cereal and milk? Okay. They could be taking tests, and what we have to do as teachers is make sure that we can encompass all of that. And that's what makes it more challenging. So I do find some of these examples a bit challenging to deal with. The big one that comes out, which is kind of a historical one, I used to see reference to Tang. How many of you know what Tang is? Okay. So there we go. We got a small percentage of the class, but if you ask virtually any chemistry instructor what Tang is, they're like, oh yeah, it's the orange Kool-Aid. Okay. I've even asked people Kool-Aid, and I still get, well, what the hell's Kool-Aid? Like, that just comes in that little liquid thing, right? I'm like, no, Kool-Aid's the dry powder that you add into the water. Depending on the variation of the Kool-Aid. Okay? So that experience is not universal. So we have to be very careful with examples from real-world applications if our population is diverse. Make sense? Okay. Pure substance. Compounds versus elements. Okay? So if we just kind of accept at face value chemically linked, what is water? It is a pure substance. Is it a compound or an element? How do you know it's a compound and not just an element? Compound or element? The definition that we were hearing shouted out for compound was two elements, or more than two. Well, that's got two. But it's the same type. What is an element? There we go. We can at least boil down elements to being within the symbols within an individual box on the periodic table of elements. That's awesome. We can at least use that. After that, it, compounds, pure substances, the rest can become a lot more complicated because those are now some variation of connection between the elements. If it is a chemical linkage, we can then look at a compound. That makes it a pure substance. If it's not a chemical linkage, it's a spatial linkage that we still don't have a way to define yet, then we're looking at a mixture. Okay? So as you go through and look at questions based on these, try to pin them back to this. And if you encounter something, you're like, I don't know what that is. There's a really good thing you could do. You can look it up. That's fair enough. Independent. Don't care about anybody else. It's not like there's somebody in the classroom that's supposed to help you figure it out. You could ask Greg. Yes. If you got anything that you're like, I have no idea what's going on in chemistry, ask Greg. Theoretically, Hi. sitting through this class four times, I should know something. <laughs> or at least where to go. Like, you know, so let's break up our elements. The periodic table has a lot of organization behind it, and it is exceptionally overwhelming, the amount of material that goes into that. Okay, so we need to slowly build up the tools to figure it out. The first classification that we can come up through here, metals, metalloids, nonmetals. Okay, those are defined within the periodic table. Where does it say metals on the periodic table? Top right says metals. To the left of the Top staircase. Right. No, no, no. Is it that red line? Okay, so I'm hearing two people suggesting, oh, it's it's in that corner or that corner. That's not what I asked. I said, where does where does the word metal, thank you, doesn't appear on the periodic table? So is there a pattern behind the organization of the periodic table that would allow us to say this section is metals? Yes. 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 There's a staircase. Okay, on the right hand side, starting at boron. Going diagonally down, you notice there's a nice little thicker line there. A little visual design element, if you will, saying, hey, there's a differentiation across this line. If you go as far away from that line as possible to the left, you are fully... Metal. You go the other direction, to the right of that staircase. You are now... Non-metal. There is a 
That could be relevant for like maybe an assignment. <laughs> for like three or four of you. Knowledge is embedded in something other than words. <laughs> well, non metals are to the extreme right, metals are to the extreme left. What's sitting through the middle on that staircase then? Some crossbreed between them, okay? That we refer to as metalloids or semi metals. They're sort of metals. We could have also called them sort of non metals, like semi non metals. Why did we choose semi metals? It's shorter, okay? Chemists are lazy, okay? And you're like, that's not true. What does H stand for? Hydrogen. Why do we call it H and not hydrogen? Because we're lazy. I don't want to write out all those other letters, starting with Y. D-R-O-G-E-N, right? Okay. The next part is, well, why would we do that? Why would I be like, oh, all of these are metals and all of these are non-metals? Why do I want to classify them that way? Why is that organization important? Okay, so it could be something about reactivity. If I mix a metal and a non-metal, maybe it explodes. So I want to keep them categorized so that I know which one's which. But if I mix metals with metals, eh, it doesn't explode. Cool, that could be a differentiation. Maybe I noticed that when I looked at all the metals, they were all shiny solids. And that when I looked at the non-metals, they were dull. And sometimes they weren't solids. So by organizing the periodic table this way, I can start to draw big parallels about patterns for individual classes. Metals tend to be solids, shiny. When I hit them, they deform. When I hit a non-metal, it tends to shatter. Okay. You get a nice diamond, right? Get that big diamond, you put that down, you hit it with a hammer, right? It's the first thing everybody wants to test. You're going to shatter the diamond. Okay? The diamond is brittle. If you did that with gold, what happens? The gold flattens and deforms. It's malleable. Okay? Those properties all tend to roughly approximate the metals or the non-metals, and we see a difference between them. That helps us to delineate them. Okay? We're classifying them. Okay? This can help us manipulate and decide how we want to react things or mix things. Conducts heat and electricity. Okay? How many of you have a pan made out of silicon? Try that again. Silicone, maybe. Okay, and just for the handle, the part that you actually put on the stove to cook, is it made out of silicon? No, what is it typically made out of? A metal, why? The heat moves from the stove into the pan and into the food. If you do it with silicon, what happens? It hinders it. It insulates it. How many of you have a silicon hot mitt? Yeah. Why do we build those out of, or build our hot mitts out of silicone? They won't conduct heat. Okay. So we can decide to build certain materials based off of these bulk classifications. Okay. So we would observe these things and tabulate them. Okay. What we will eventually be looking at is what happens. If we now just collect all of these things and we just leave them in complete disarray and we don't organize them. Well, if they aren't organized, we don't see any patterns, which then means what do we have to do? Memorize. You would have to memorize everything as its own distinct unit of information with zero connection to anything else. It sounds awful. Okay? So let's take a look at those pictures. What do you think? Metals, non-metals, okay? Those are all solids, and they're shiny. Do you know that they're malleable? No. No, why not? 
shine and the phase is also a physical property, so I don't accept that. It has to be tested. You would have to hit it. We don't have the material to hit. So just looking at the picture, we can really only use those top two categories. Metals or non-metals? Non-metals. Non Some of those get a little bit difficult to represent because we're referencing gases. Right. Metals or non-metals? A couple people shouted out metalloids. Why'd you say metalloids? We already did the other two is probably a good yeah. step why, yeah. <laughs> These ones are metalloids. What makes the metalloids so much more difficult to classify? <laughs> metalloids have the properties of both, okay? So they can be solids, they can be shiny, they could be dull, okay? There's a mixture all the way through of the metalloids. Okay, so just because it's a metalloid doesn't mean it has an even mixture of both. It could act more like a metal or more like a non-metal. Okay, their properties end up being a little bit weird. Okay, so which gets us to a fun little part. Here's our periodic table. Okay, you are supposed to be memorizing elements. We started class off actually looking at that. There's a lot of periodic elements up there to memorize. You do not have to memorize them all. Okay? But what you need to start doing is working on that list. Within that list, you should also be adding some extra pieces of information. Solid, liquid, gas. How would you know it's a solid, liquid, or a gas? Okay. One option, you just said, Mike, that the metals were all solids. Not quite, I said mostly. Right? And we said the non-metals were solids and gases, mostly. But even if we did non-metals, that becomes problematic, right? Because, well, which one's which? Is it a solid or is it a gas? Okay? It might be useful if, say, we had some legend or key that would tell us what it was. Like at the bottom of the periodic table where it says black is a solid, red is... A gas. Blue is a liquid. We now have that information encoded on the periodic table. Okay. So when you go through this memorization process, it's not just memorizing the element and its symbol. Try and memorize the element, the symbol, ballpark location on the periodic table so that you can find it easier. Okay. Even the colors? Even the colors. Okay. Kind of makes sense? Oh. Yeah, we'll just move on. Okay, which is now going to move us into chapter four. Okay, we did not call it, cover all of chapter three, but we covered as much as I wanted to cover for the moment, which takes us into chapter four. Chapter four, I think, is really cool because it talks a lot about history and how we build our understanding of chemistry. Okay, as a history class or a history part, I think it requires a bit more of memorization. Right? So you're going to have to start to associate some famous discoveries with the scientists, their experiments, and their conclusions. Okay? So as we go through and talk about them, see if you can come up with patterns or parallels or key words to tie to them. Okay? So it starts off with Dalton really, really early on, early 1800s. And Dalton comes up with his own atomic theory. So based off of all of these observations of long dead people observing the different elements that were found, he started to say, well, there's so much stuff out there, we need to start actually collecting it and organizing it. So he started to organize it into his periodic table. Where's Dalton's periodic table? Right there. That is Dalton's periodic table. What differences do you know? What's that? We have a whole lot more on ours than Dalton's. Why? It took a while to discover those elements. Okay? Some of the elements up there are actually man-made. Dalton can't make them because he doesn't have the technology yet. Okay? So he's just compiling some of the information he's got to try and organize this. What else do you notice about it? 
shapes. Cool symbols, nice shapes. That's nice. Yeah. Those are cool symbols and nice shapes. Would you like to memorize a periodic table that's on our wall with a bunch of cool symbols and shapes instead of just a bunch of letters? <laughs> Only okay. 20 of them. <laughs> we have to adapt forward. <laughs> okay. So 118 different symbols and shapes, probably tedious. The letters we can tie to something. We can tie those letters to names or the language that was used to create those symbols. Somebody mumbled words. Words also works. <laughs> okay. What else did Dalton's kind of periodic table show? What do we see below this? Molecules, compounds. He's trying to show that if I take this circle with a dot and I put it next to a circle, that they are chemically linked. How did he represent the chemical linkage? By drawing them right next to each other. By drawing them touching each other. Okay? We still do that. The spacing between those symbols. Okay? So we have to be aware of that when we go through and look at our representations moving forward because we're still following some of those principles. Okay? So let's break down his rules. Number one, an element is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. Okay? So we went through and said, if I break down this compound as small as I can get, the smallest I can get is to an element. That is the root of it. Can't get any smaller than that. Those of you who have some science knowledge, is that true? No, that's false. Okay. So a good thing thinking forwards. We're going to be addressing these on why they failed, but not as explicitly. Might be a good thing for you as we go through and mark these out as false to be like, I need to figure out why that's false. How do we know that that is now false? We aren't there yet. It's going to happen. Two, all atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. False. Atoms of different elements combine to form compounds. If I take hydrogen and oxygen and I mix them together, what could I make? I could make water, <laughs> H2O. So yes, this is true. Okay. Compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. That one becomes a little bit trickier if you don't have a lot of experience. But what he's saying is that when I build a molecule, I can't break those atoms apart and get half of an atom to make a molecule. They have to be whole numbers. So when we talked about water, we said its formula was H2O. Two meaning two hydrogens, okay? which is a notation behind that symbolism, and we'll talk about that. So yes, this is also true. We get small whole number ratios. Atoms combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. Two men walk into a bar. First one orders a glass of H2O. The second one says, I'll have H2O too. <laughs> the second one dies. And I botched that, but it's close enough. Okay. I don't remember the alternate ending. Oh, I remember the alternate. Go for it. Uh, the second one lives because the bartender knows how to distinguish linguistic cues. <laughs> okay. So yes. We can combine atoms. Both of those jokes sounds like they went either way too low or way too high is what it sounded like to me. Okay. Most of our jokes. Okay. Yes, we can combine them in different ratios to make different compounds. Okay. How would we know they were combined in different ratios? How do I know hydrogen and oxygen were mixed in different ratios? There's another two. There's another two. We've added another number there. That's it. Okay. You're like, oh, that's simple and stupid. It's such a simple observation that students horribly screw that up throughout the semester. 
horribly. Okay? So that one's also true. So now let's fast forward now a little bit. Okay? And by a little bit, we're looking at almost 100 years for us to get to Thompson's model. So late 1800s. Okay? And he comes up with two subatomic particles. He says we've got electrons, and because we have electrons, we must also have protons. Okay? And what this discovery hinged on was that this charge. He was able to discover that we had a negative charged particle. Okay? And if we have that negatively charged particle, that had to have come from somewhere. And it didn't matter what substance was used, which element, we could still find that substance or that electron. Which meant that atoms could be destroyed or broken apart into smaller pieces. Once he knew we had an electron, he then also knew we had to have a positive charge or proton to counteract it because electrons are highly dangerous. Really? Okay. Were you ever told as a kid to not stick a fork in the electrical outlet? Okay. Maybe you weren't t told that because they were just watching to see. Okay. You know, education, you learn through failure. Okay. It, it's a little bit of a zap. Don't do it. Okay. What's coming out of the electrical outlet? Electricity, which is electrons. Electrons are very high energy particles because when we're walking through natural air, we aren't getting shocked every five seconds. Okay? We knew something had to be there to counteract them. Okay? What hinged on this? Okay? Why did we have to wait 100 years for Thompson to be able to do this? The technology. What technology? Not a microscope because we can't see them. Electron microscopes, another 100 years. It's a vacuum. The technology that we needed was a vacuum. Okay. Electrons are highly unstable. That means if I somehow generate one and there's something there, what happens? It reacts, disappears. I, don't, I can't detect it anymore. So I have to build a system that removes all of the something so that I can see electrons. Okay? Removing all of that something is a vacuum. Okay? And that's ultimately put into a cathode ray tube, okay? sometimes referred to as a cathode ray gun. And what they were able to see is that if we applied a voltage to opposite ends of this tube that has a vacuum in it, that the tube would start to fluoresce. A fluorescent screen placed at the end of that tube that has nothing in it, but has a bunch of electricity somehow buzzing near it, the screen started to glow. Why did it glow? Because something had to have been moving through there. That something they were able to discover to be an electron because when they put a magnet near it, what happened to the glow? It moved to different spots on the screen. Pretty insanely cool. Okay? Is that what would happen to old like, computer screens when you put a magnet on? Oh. So if you've heard of cathode ray tubes before or had enough background saying like playing around with things, CRT. CRTs, they are old school TVs, are thousands of cathode ray tubes. The pixels in them are individual cathode ray tubes. This is why when you put a magnet near them, you F with the whole system. Okay. And with that, we'll go ahead and end there. You have our WS the cathode. Cath is in Kathy. Sorry, let me stop that.